it's called How to Date Better. And How to Date Better is based upon the research I've been doing about the past four or five years that started with attachment theory and then moved into trauma and childhood development and eventually this recognition of the difference between the conscious and subconscious minds that get us all screwed up all the time and the five pillars of attachment. I'm Kirby. I uh, host and facilitate and usually end up lecturing for the whole time. We talk about relationship issues, but I firmly believe 100% that our romantic relationships are like a little subconscious theater that is an acting out of the wounds that we experienced in the first 18 to 24 months of life. And so the way that you date better is to get more in touch with your own wounds and your own issues and get a handle on that and build some effective tools on how to navigate those wounds or release them. And then as you do that in the homework phase, it makes you more present, more emotionally available, more regulated. All the things get better in dating. Once we've done the homework, the relationship gets better. So that's the fundamental premise of where, where I start from. Yeah, anger, fear, euphoria, and confusion are kind of the three, four indicators that a trauma just got activated. Euphoria is like, I'm super blissed out on a, I'm living on a cloud, you know, new relationship energy. You meet the person and you're just like, woo, right? That's 100% indicator that a trauma just got activated. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not, that's not a, yeah, a lot of people don't like that idea, but um, all the evidence supports it. Recognizing our boundaries and that when we begin to get soft on them, yeah. like there's a lot going on that gets us to the point that we're soft on boundaries, but then there's, it's like, it's like this thing that spins around and like, it's like it builds energy in the sense that I get soft on my boundaries. So there's a bunch of trauma crap happening in my brain that makes me get soft on boundaries because I'm actually prioritizing something else. So then the boundaries fail, but then because the boundaries fail, now I've abandoned myself and that starts this whole other cycle internally. And so there, there's a bunch of stuff that happens with boundary yeah. stuff. I, we'll, we'll talk about that more. Yeah. So. Okay, so the question is, if we go into a date or a dating type situation, either chatting or in person, and that person starts talking about like, well, I'm just not feeling the chemistry, like, what do we do? And, and is that worth filtering them on, right? Easy. Yeah, 100% yes, 100%. Um, person says chemistry, <laughs> what you can translate that into is, I'm not feeling my attachment wounds activated enough. Uh. <laughs> chemistry is, <laughs> it's so bizarre. Chemistry is an activation of the panic that arises from, a, from a, an attachment wound. It's just, it's in this particular dynamic, there's something there that I think I can get away with it. Most of the time, we're choosing people, most of the time, we're choosing people based upon a whole bunch of data that our conscious mind cannot see, but our subconscious can. And what the subconscious is seeing is that person is enough like mom or dad that if I get them close to me and I get them to love me enough, that wound will go away. That is why I say attraction is a trauma response. If there is no one that's beginning, Way healthier, yeah. Yeah, then it's way, I mean, it can still be, it can still be attachment wounds, which is why I'm always saying that the best thing you can do is know yourself and know your own wounds and know where you get triggered. But in general, if you say there's no attraction at the beginning, and then we spend time, and then we spend time, and then we spend time, and this attraction builds, that's way better chance, way better chance of that being healthy. But again, hold your hand out, see if your fingers are shaking. If your fingers are shaking, that means you've got enough cortisol and epinephrine running through your system that you are activated. I, I mean, I understand that there's a, there's a little of nerves in the process. What are the nerves coming from? 
Any guesses? Will they like me? Right? Will they approve of me? Am I enough? Am I lovable? Am I attractive? Am I sexy? Am I wanted? Am I am I wanted? Am I chosen? Will they prioritize me? So when you're in a healthy relationship, it's a bit boring, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, everyone says this. Like when I first got into this field, there's some teachers saying that, and I'm like, you guys. And then <laughs> Yeah and, then, yeah, and then later on, I'm just like, oh, oh, I get it. I see. Yeah, it is. It's like as you transition away from the traumas of attachment wounding into what we would call a healthy space, um, yeah, relationships start feeling really boring. These are good questions. I don't have answers for all of them because I've, I'm exploring those myself. But I, I am of the opinion that if we know that sex sexual relations penetrative or not creates this massive flood of bonding hormones bonding chemicals and happy endorphin chemicals inside the brain if we know that that happens it seems like that would be like a nuclear bomb for self-control so we should be more restrictive not less right if i've got if i've got a fundamental chemistry set inside my brain that's going to create all this weird attachment bonding mechanisms with someone that I engage with on a close intimate level, then I should be a little bit careful about how I use that or allow that chemistry set to fire, right? Now, I'm not saying don't have sex. I'm just saying that like recognize the dynamics that of the fundamental neurophysiology of our brain at the beginning to say, oh, I see someone, they're attractive, the chemistry goes off. <laughs> Back to the chemistry question. Chemistry fires. Oh my God. This huge cocktail of happy chemicals gets erupted into our brain. And then that's this guy. He like hits this button right here and says, mm -hmm. euphoria, happy chemicals, right? Because he thinks a wound is about to get resolved. This is my five-year-old. That's my adult me. This is a fundamental piece of my philosophy. The two mind method is what I call it. This is something I've been creating over the past couple of years. The, this is based upon a fundamental belief that I have that treating a human being as a single entity is a fundamental mistake. It's a, there's at least two people, always. One of them is an adult that would be regulated, calm, hopefully, planning. He has, that's what these things are for. The, the conscious brain has, is really good at some things. It is good at predicting the future. It's good at creating a model. It says, oh, if I knock the glass off, it's going to hit the ground. It's going to shatter. Water's going to go all over the place. There's going to be mold on the carpet, right? That is something that this brain thought of because a, a gust of wind came in and there was a glass rattling on the table, right? This guy does not have that ability. He does not have the ability to see the future. So, or predict the future. And so the conscious mind predicts the future. He can do this cause and effect thing. He can deduce cause and effect relationships. He has the, I'll come back to inhibition. The concept of I, like me, who I am, my life, my thoughts, dreams, personality, that's all up here. That's not down there. Language lives up here. Down here, behind the curtain, like kind of Wizard of Oz style, here's my five-year-old. And he sits at this control panel. And the control panel has buttons for all of my emotions. Also, all of my hormonal releases. There's sections of the brain. It's like hypothalamus and stuff. Um, associations and imagery. Dreams are this guy learning stuff. Like associations are like, that's a tree. This is a tree. They look different but there's something in common. The next bit that's probably the most important thing is they have two different memory systems. So when we're born with a system that's called procedural or implicit memory, and that's what we're born with. The procedural memory system is like the thing that allows me to reach up and cap catch a ball that's flying through the air. 
It's the thing that allows us to dance. It's the thing that allows us to drive without thinking about it. That's the procedural memory system at work. We are not actively involved with any kind of cognition about what I'm doing. It's just something happens, my brain sees it, recognizes it, and says, I got this, and then activates all the muscles. Well, where that gets tricky is that seeing someone be, that is seeing an event that we would call triggering, the brain sees the stimulus and says, I got this, and then it activates your entire threat response, your fight or flight system. That's the procedural memory system at work. The narrative memory system, we're not born with. We have to, it's something that our brain builds over about an 18 months to 24 months period. And that's the one that allows us to say, I woke up at seven, I went to the gym for an hour, then I left, I drove for half an hour, I went to Starbucks, had this kind of coffee, whatever, right? It's like A, B, C, D, each of those is a self-contained concept. There's the gym period, there's the driving period, there's the Starbucks period. This is super important because that's how trauma works. This is the fundamental basis of the two mind method. So when I'm interacting with someone, it's not, it's not that I'm interacting with my girlfriend, it's which one am I interacting with? If she's screaming at me right now, is it the adult her or is it the child her? Anger, big powerful emotion, is down here. That's why I say, when was the last time you got angry? Uh, a lot of people are new, so you haven't, I've, when I first started this, we focused a lot about on filtering questions. And filtering questions are this idea, you go to the first date, you sit down at the table, and you've got questions to ask the person that are harsh and brutal and filtering. Because when you're dating, if you're looking for a long-term stable relationship, that's my caveat. If you're looking for fun or whatever, that's different and that's okay. But if you're looking for a long-term dedicated relationship, you should be dating looking for a no. You're not looking for a yes. Because if you're looking for a yes, you will find it because this kid that's got all his attachment wounds because he didn't get enough of that, he will find a reason to attach to this person if they're available, not even available. They'll find, you'll find a yes. If you go looking for a yes, you'll find it. And then, boom, you're attached. And then, boom, you realize this relationship isn't working. And then, boom, you come face to face with the fact that you suck at ending relationships. At least that's true for most of us. All right? So, my philosophy on this is, if I recognize and come to terms with the fact that I suck at ending a relationship, then it makes sense that I'd be more restrictive at the front door. I'm not even going to let you in my house until you've proven that you're worthy to set foot inside my house. So how do I do that? I ask very pointed questions that tell me a lot about the person. And one of those questions is, when was the last time you got really pissed? And what did you do about it? And what do you think that came from? And what are you doing about it now? And if a person can answer those four questions in a way that you're like, wow, yeah, this guy's really got his shit together. Or like, woo, he got really vulnerable, right? And he, like, the guy that sits there is just like, oh yeah, just 10 minutes ago, <laughs> and I was doing this thing, I got furious, and then I did some breathing, and I calmed myself down, I know that that, is a reflection of this problematic relationship I had with my father when I was younger, and I'm working on it, and I'm working on it in these ways, right? That's the guy you want to say yes to. But the guy that says, no, I don't get angry, you're like, ma. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> exactly, it's like, thank you very much, you can leave. Um, and the other thing is that like, when you're dating, that person doesn't owe me anything and I don't owe them anything. I'm a big proponent of like, if you're sitting here at a date and you're having this thing and they do a clear non, you know, they cross one of my non-negotiables in a big clear way and it feels uncomfortable. And I'm like, there's 0% chance that this relationship is going to, you know, that there's going to be a second date. I can just get up and walk away. 
I don't have to say thank you. I don't have to, I mean, I need to pay the bill, but yeah. But you know, the, the, the principle is that like, you don't owe them anything. And so many of us, especially women, unfortunately, but men too, I know a gajillion men who are brought up to be people pleasers. If we have people pleaser dynamics alive inside us, we, those neural pathways will fire like a bonfire inside to be like, no, I got to do this. I'm going to be nice in this way. I got to be blah, blah, blah. And like, okay. And he's like, what about that second date? And you're just like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll get back to you. No, if that's not what you're feeling, the moment that you say, oh yeah, maybe kind of whatever you are abandoning yourself. And guess what? That little girl inside just saw you do it. And she said that what she just saw is you're making his opinion more important than mine. You are betraying me. You don't care about me. I do not feel wanted, chosen, or prioritized by you. The subconscious never sleeps, ever. It is always awake, it is always scanning, and it's always, always, always pursuing one goal, the survival of this organism. It wants to feel safe and it wants to survive. Life isn't fair. I mean, I was just talking to you guys about this yesterday, that it's like one of the greatest injustices that I feel, <laughs> this is ironic, the greatest injustices that I feel ever happened in my life was this idea that justice actually exists. And I'm just like, because I found myself in so many situations where I'm like, that's not just not fair. That's not the way it works. This person did horrible things. There should be some kind of consequence or karmic backlash or whatever. And they're over there living this pretty life. And I'm just like, ah. And so what that happened is in my world, that created this massive friction between my expectations and what life actually was. And when that happened, it basically aggravated all of my traumas because I don't have it up here yet, but one of the traits that I believe is common in all traumatic experiences is I cannot escape. Like I am trapped here. I am being used and this situation is unsafe getting in touch with this inner child that I have that lives inside and getting crystal clear on what I want in this world, what I want from this situation, what I will put up with and what I won't put up with. Because anger is the thing that erupts when I'm actually out of alignment with myself and I've let things go further than she wants me to. If I'm ahead of the game and I know where I am and I know where I stand, it doesn't erupt into anger. It comes out as this kind of natural expression of a boundary. You just like, you walk into the situation. I mean, I'm not a woman, obviously, so I, but I'm going to make some guesses. It's just like you walk into a situation and then some guy is just like, oh, I got one. Uh, so she, it was this woman and she was, um, she had just become a professor at the university in my hometown. And she is, I don't know, 31, 32, but she looks young. And so she's sitting there in her office, the computer's broken, and she sends a tech request and the tech guy comes in and he speaks down to her because he thinks that she's just a freshman student, but she's actually a PhD professor, right? So all this anger erupts inside. And what does she do? She lets the situation pass. And then she's just furious inside and she goes and vents to all of her support network, right? That is a sign of being out of alignment with self. Now let's flip that around. Same situation. The guy walks in, he says, da, 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 da. He speaks down and the person says, I'm a PhD professor and I know my worth and I got, and I know why I came to be here and I will not tolerate that kind of communication with me. And if you want to try again, I'm happy to sit here and let you try again. If you don't want to try again, or you want to stay in this disrespectful manner, then please leave my office because I do have that authority. And I will be talking to someone that has authority over you. Right. And it's this, and it's like this firm, I know who I am. I know where I stand. I know what my value is. 
and I'm not going to put up with this thing that comes towards me because I've spoken in the past about narcissists and stuff because the thing is when you capture that skill and you're able to live it and breathe it, I guess embody it is the word around here, when you're able to embody that skill, like there's something, there's all these like thousands of little microscopic transmissions that you are putting off. You're demonstrating the way you walk, the way your eyes move, the way your hands move, whatever, right? I don't even know what they all are. But the subconscious is tracking 10 million bits of data per second. All of us. This one is tracking like 2,000, right? So I walk into a room and there's one of these asshole, narcissist, dismissive avoidant, whatever, blah, 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 whatever elemental P we want to put on them. They see me, their subconscious sees me being strong. And they're like, I don't want any of that. It's like, this is the kind of the neurophysiological explanation for when you get in touch with yourself and you, and you stand in your confidence, if people like start self-selecting out of your life. They're just like, I oftentimes, in my experience, they start finding you scary. They start being intimidated by someone that they can't manipulate. Whereas on the flip side, when you walk in and you're just like, okay, I'm a people pleaser. And it's like, I want to make sure everything, everybody feels nice and all that kind of stuff. Guess what? They see that too. And they say, oh, there's someone I can manipulate. Not consciously, but subconsciously. Right? The answer to the manipulators and the narcissists and all that other kind of stuff in the world, it's like, get here, get in touch with this, and then get really good at just walking in and being like, I know who I am and I know where I stand. And I have no interest in this. Yeah. I think that's like the unspoken challenge of the healing journey is that like, because it's so easy to kind of do, well, this feels nasty to say false spiritualism, but it's kind of what it is. But like the people that kind of do the false spiritualism, it's like there's still this massive insecure train wreck inside, but they found some community of other insecure train wrecks and then they all kind of swirl around together, all reinforcing each other. And then they're like, whoo, we're in this commune and everything's all grand. But as soon as it, as soon as a trigger gets hit, boom, right? And it's like, because, I mean, I don't want to, I don't believe in shame. I don't want to shame any of that. But it's like, the reason I believe that happens is because the fear of isolation and disconnection is still so incredibly strong in them. They're like, I'm going to create this entire false everything of me and who I am in the world and everything else so that I can still be in fellowship and, and connection with other people because being alone is terrifying. I'll tell you something that like a lot of my clients that I see one-on-one, -on -one, um, <laughs> they usually find me because they're going through a big breakup. And it, you know, there, there's this humongous heartbreak and this intrusive thoughts and rumination and all this kind of spinning of, of all these difficult feelings because the person that I care about just abandoned me. And I know that statistically speaking, and so far empirically 100% of the time, once you are done with me, you won't even want that person anymore, right? It's like once you connect with yourself and you understand what it is you truly want in life, you're going to look back at this relationship and be like, I know, like that's not even what I want. Why was I so hung up on that person? It's like that is what it feels like to have an attachment wound that's on fire because the attachment wounds, there's this big button over here. The kid can just go click. And he floods the prefrontal cortex with um, a certain type of stress hormone. And when that happens, he just shuts it off. And all these things go away. So he, the, the inner child has an override button. We see it all the time when we see people get triggered. That's the inner child walks up and says, I don't trust you to take care of the situation in a way that I'm happy with, that protects my survival, this is the, he says, I don't trust you. So you don't get to drive the bus anymore. And he goes, quick, floods the brain with uh, norepinephrine, shuts off the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain basically goes to sleep and he's like, woo, I'm driving now. But the, unfortunately, he has the emotional maturity of a five-year-old. So he usually just drives, he's like, 
go get the cookie, go get validation, go get sex, whatever. He races towards this thing that he thinks will make his pain go away. And then he's like, yeah, I got it. Okay, good. And then he, this, you know, he goes back to sleep or goes back into hiding, releases control. And then I wake up and I'm like, I'm like my whole life is in fire around me. I'm like, what just happened? Right? <laughs> this is a great question. This is a great question. No one's asked that one before. So yeah, a lot of healing modalities have this idea that like we need more fun in our life. And I do agree with that. But I do not, as this point in time, I do not agree with the idea that letting the inner child be free and have fun is actually the self-love that we're looking for. The self-love we're looking for is this one. It's that every moment of every day in every relational interaction, I choose you instead of them. Like the reason I do all of this is exactly for that reason. Because attachment wounds form in the first 18 to 24 months. And the way I see it is that to deal with an attachment wound after it is solidified takes thousands of hours and thousands of dollars and tremendous amount of emotional effort. So it's far better to prevent the attachment wound from happening in the first place. So that's a big question what you asked. That's a big question what you asked. I mean, we can steer in that direction if you want, but that is literally my passion in life is that I want to get this information out to enough people and have it spread in kind of that exponential way so that it is how attachment to mine and trauma function is in everybody's mind when they pop out a kid so that that first 18 months, we give that child a chance to be trauma free. The answer is over here. Uh, this is what I, this is the uh, Daniel Brown is his name. This is a, a model that was put forth by a guy by the name of Dr. Daniel Brown. Um, I call it the five pillars of attachment. Um, Daniel Brown is one of those guys that he and his team get called when they find a Catholic orphanage where the children have been molested for 18 years. So these children have had a horrific childhood. Their attachment system is a total wreck. And taking them into normal modalities of therapy were ineffective. And so he and his research team spent two or three years, well, they spent, I think they spent two or three years just developing this concept and then another five to 10 years flushing it out. But the premise here, and a little bit of this is my, uh, my additions, but it's this idea why I keep pointing this out is that I believe that every child that comes out of the womb has a fundamental instinctive craving, like a hunger for a feeling and that feeling is this mix of wanted chosen and prioritized the child wants to feel it not know it i want to feel that i'm wanted i want to feel that you choose me and i want to feel that you are going to prioritize me over other things okay so that's the that's the core desire okay how do we how do we give that feeling to another person that's where the five pillars come in turns out that if you get if you do these five experiences with a human being, they end up feeling wanted, chosen, prioritized. The first one is felt safety. Not known safety, felt safety. It's not, I know I'm safe in this room. It's like, I'm so safe in this room, why are you even asking? Right? Because it's like, it's not even a question. I know it, I feel it, it's deep down. I know... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Luckily, we've got answers. <laughs> this is a tough one. I, I mean, it's number one because it's the most important. All healing begins with safety. All trauma healing begins with safety. But how do you tell someone, hey, you need to be safe? I want to make sure you feel safe right now. It just doesn't work, right? You have to evoke a feeling of safety. How do we do that? You focus on the other four. Okay, number two is attunement. Attunement is this idea that some powerful entity outside myself knows who I am. Not just knows who I am, but they're actively pursuing and curious about my inner worlds. So if someone's attuning to me, they're saying, how did that feel for you? 
what's it like? Oh, well, if this is true and that's true, then maybe this is true also. Like they're, they're able to, they know enough about me that they're able to guess my experience even though, when I haven't told them. Now, we're not supposed to read minds in a relationship, yes, but attunement is super amazing. Guess what? For a baby that doesn't have the ability to speak yet, super important. But it's also super important when my partner just got super triggered and her five-year-old took over and she can't even tell me what's wrong. She's just triggered to the moon. I'm like, okay, I know these things about her. So maybe she needs a foot rub right now, right? You know, that's attunement. Attuning to is saying, I want to know your inner world. Being attuned to is that person wants to know my inner world. That's attunement. Number three, support when dysregulated. This is this idea, you get to be a wild, dysregulated animal when you're triggered. It's okay. And me, as an act of love, I'm going to create a container in which you can experience this. There will never be shame in my presence. There will never be blame in my presence. My way that I support you when you're dysregulated is to make sure that you're safe physically and emotionally as I can, and I support you, and I'm present, and I'm look it's not just like, okay, go be, go be dysregulated. It's like, no, I'm here with you, and I, as the stable one, am creating a line, a boundary of safety so that you can be dysregulated as you want. What does that look like? Okay. This is really important because it comes up over here in trauma. Because, in my opinion, this is why we're in relationships. Dating this girl. Something happens. She loses it. It's very clear. Hands are shaking. She can barely communicate. Her pupils are dilated. Skin underneath her eyes quivering. And I see all this happening. And then I see the degree of her activation climbing and climbing and climbing. And I'm like, I need to demonstrate the five pillars of attachment. I can't tell her you're safe right now, but I can say, what's going on for you? If you can share, you don't have to. I'm here with you. I recognize that you're so afraid that my physical proximity is being detected as a threat. Even though you know it's not, your child is seeing me, my physical proximity as a threat. So I back away. I go increase the light level so that, so that there's more light coming into the, her eyeballs, so that the, the, the brain is not in this kind of primitive lurking in the darkness kind of thing. So I make the room really bright. I monitor my proximity. I monitor my modulation of voice because as this is happening, I'm checking in with myself and I say, do I have the capacity to hold space for this woman while she's dysregulated? Yeah, I do. I feel pretty good right now. I can do this. So I do it. I make sure there's no interruptions. And then it's just like, this is okay. Then I move to the next one. Expressed the light. Yeah. What they say, I don't have the capacity. If you are oh, yeah, that's a rough one. So what do you do? You say I don't have capacity for this right now. And then you leave. Yeah. But that's like, <laughs> yeah. But isn't that it's re traumatizing them? But like, but it's like not like your problem. Yeah. I know that sounds heartless oh, because if you stay when you don't have capacity, guess who's watching? Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily. But their inner child, like their abandonment. Yes. But it is also triggers are a gift. Yeah. It is a massive trigger. I literally just went through this three or four months ago yeah. with someone who had a very, very traumatized life, childhood. And I had to do that one time because the way that the activate, this is an earlier one. I got better at it over time. But when, the way that the earlier activation came up, it came out really blamey. And, and like, you're the cause of all my problems and you're a horrible person and blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't 
capable of receiving that in that moment. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm getting triggered. I have about 30 seconds before I lose my shit. I do not want to say anything. I do not want to bring any of my shit into this space between us. So I'm going to leave before I say something that I regret. It's like, bah, 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 why are you leaving? And I, I'm sorry. And then she came at me with a bunch of questions and I was like, <laughs> you did not listen. I can't speak right now. Right? Got my stuff, closed the door, went on a walk. Because this is an important one for the new people. When you are super triggered, there's this release of stress hormones in the body that's very powerful. And it takes about 35 to 45 minutes for those stress hormones to be reabsorbed back in the system. If you get, if you go from zero to 10 or ten, five to 10, whatever, if you go to 10 on your triggered scale or even a nine, forget the idea of trying to resolve it in that moment. So the question is, what do I do if I'm in this place with the container with my partner who's triggered and I ask them to share and they don't have that capability? Then I go to attunement and I say, attuning to this person right now is recognizing they do not have that capacity. And asking for it or demanding it or expecting it is going to create further pressure on a system that's already snapped. So I just need to hold the space and see what arises. Now, over time, you know, that's for, that's the single moment, right? That's a single loving act. But over time, if I'm with the same partner and this thing happens again and they're not able to share anything and there's no forward progression, like the needle of their trauma or their triggers doesn't move two months, three months, four months, then I need to start asking the question, why am I still here? Why do I keep choosing this situation with a person that is not actually moving in any visible way? They're, they're not growing in any visible way, right? That, then it's on me, right? In an, in an individual act of triggering, the best thing I can do, the greatest act of love, is to hold the space and allow this bundle of emotions, which is a trauma activation, allow that emotion to channel through their physical body and come out a little bit because in the process of doing that, hopefully that trauma will unwind just a little bit. And as evidence for this, I can say in this relationship I have with someone that was tied up and abused and abandoned and grew up on the street. And I mean, the father was assassinated. I mean, just like a whole, <laughs> a whole laundry list. Africa is a rough place. Um, this person, we watched it. We watched it play out in a five-month time period. She was here for five months, and in that five months, we had moments at the beginning that were activating, dysregulated to a ten. And then we held the space. We followed the principles. She came back down. The trauma's released, the memories become unlocked, we process the memories, and guess what? It's not triggering anymore. You definitely feel seen and heard when that person is actively trying to guess or estimate what is happening for me. So I'm going to ask a question. Raise your hand if this is true. I can think of a time that I was super, super triggered, and I knew I was triggered, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So the reason I ask that is because if I've created this container and here's my partner over there and they're wigging out, they know they're wigging out and they know they can't communicate. Guess what happens? Shame. How? What's, yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's, but it's, a, there's oftentimes a shame element that manifests there when a person is like, I'm, I'm out of control. I'm dysregulated. That's already socially shameful. I'm doing it in front of this person that I'm always trying to impress. What an idiot. How does my hair look? Am I frothing at the mouth? Right? You know, there's a shame thing that activates and it's like, I know I'm freaking out and I know I'm confused and I know I can't communicate right now. I feel like a loser. Why are you still here? This will happen with avoidance a lot. Why? Like I'm so fucked up right now. 
I don't want you to see me like this. Why are you still here? I can't do this for you. I'm not good enough. Zoom, 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 right? If you do this thing with holding the container with some grace, I mean, with a little bit of skill, they begin to trust that this is a real experience and that you are actually there for them. The first time they can doubt it. Second time, maybe two. But by the third time, if you're consistent with this and you do it with strength and integrity, they will be convinced and they'll just be like, oh my God, this person has seen me at my worst and they're still prioritizing me. Express delight. So express delight is this idea, you're doing such a great job. All I can see that you can't communicate right now, but I can see you trying. This is amazing, right? Like I am going to verbally express my delight that you exist and, and that you're doing things the way you do. I frequently say, walking up and saying, hey, Sally, I love you, easy. It's very different for me to climb up on top of the rooftops and shout to the whole village, I am elated that Sally exists. That's expressed delight. And a child that is 18 months old can tell the difference. So the idea of expressed delight has this kind of built in requirement that I have to get vulnerable and expose myself in order to express my delight in your existence. It's not just, hey, I like you. It's that I'm going to put on this crazy suit and I'm going to go out there and make a fool out of myself so that you know that you are the most important person in my world. Right? This is the craving that we have when we come out of the womb, which is this guy. And so the way that we develop self-love, I'll tell you, I was doing this for like four years before I knew what the f self-love meant. Like all the books, all the things, everyone says this word, and I'd be in these groups, like there's these discussion groups, like 100 people, and 90 of them are like, what is self-love, how do I do it? And everyone's like, well, maybe take a bath, uh, light some candles, take yourself on a date, there's that one, like what? Okay, um, this is my opinion of what self-love is. Self-love is recognizing that my inner child wants this. And if he's not going to get it from me, he's going to push that hijack button, put me to sleep, and he's going to go out and get it from some woman. So the way that I practice and exhibit and build and manifest self-love in my life is I have to give him this. I have to tell him every moment of every day in every way, you are the most important thing in my life and I'm not gonna prioritize anybody else over you. And when he starts, when you start doing this, he'll be like, the f you say, <laughs> you're full of shit. <laughs> he won't believe you because we most of us have spent multiple decades ignoring or abandoning him, right? And so just like a five-year-old child, he's gonna be like, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. So we got to earn it. That comes from fear. That is, I don't want to be seen and heard. I don't want anyone to cherish me with that level of importance. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. This, this maps with the avoidant attachment style directly. The, the avoidant attachment style doesn't want to be seen like that because it's associated with pain and discomfort, usually. I don't want to project onto you, but this is, in the books, this is statistically, yeah. Good question. Okay, so the question is, there's the five love languages, and some of the love languages are not verbal, right? It's like gifts, words of, I mean, words of affirmation is verbal, gifts, quality time, all that kind of stuff. The idea of expressed delight is not, it's not necessarily verbal, it, but it is expressed in the sense that, it, yes, it has to be, this is where I feel, thank you, that's a great question. This is where I feel it's important is that it, there's that angle of vulnerability to it. Maybe I'm not saying I love you, but I'm giving a gift in a way that I had to be vulnerable to do it. I had to expose myself to ridicule or, or 
something, right? I had to, I had to expose myself in some way in order to tell you how much you matter to me. We see that. Think about the times you've seen another person do that for you, right? You're just like, wow. They like went down, they went down to the flower shop and talked to the guy and found out what my favorite flower was. And I know he hates talking to strangers. And it's like, well, he did that anyway. And then he called all these friends and he's like kind of an internal, you know, uh, whatever, intro introvert. But he still like called all my friends and got this whole party together for me. I mean, it's just like he went above and beyond. It's just like, wow, I feel it, right? It's not just going through the motions. So that's my answer to the love language thing. Repeating the question is, yeah. if I'm going to express delight to my inner child, how do I do that in a way that avoids, that doesn't turn me into a raging egotist, right? It's not an interesting question, right? That's a fantastic question. To my inner child or to my partner's to my, inner child. To my inner child. Right. So here's my adult. I'm expressing loads of, in, loads of delight for my inner child. How do I do that without him becoming just a raging, self-absorbed? Here's how we do that. Express delight for my relationship with my inner child. Sure, it can be like, oh, you're so great, and blah, 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 blah. That's all empty. Where it matters is that I'm expressing delight when he does something uncomfortable. Oh, you're feeling really angry right now? Thank you for sharing that with me. You're feeling sad right now? Oh, we get to cry now? I know that crying is so good for us neurologically, like neurophysiologically, crying is amazing. Like literally. We have baked into us one of the biggest tools ever, ever for processing trauma. And that's just crying. We don't need, we don't need training. We don't need to go through a 10 step. I mean, just crying does so many amazing things inside the brain that are positive. Blew my mind when I learned that. So it's like the tear, like we're going through this stuff. We're thinking about things and boom, and it catches right here. For me, it's a solar plexus. And it's just like, ooh. I'm like, that's, that could be a cry. In the past, it wouldn't have been because I would have sh shoved it down. But I'm like, ooh, it's happening. And I go to my inner child and I'm like, thank you for trusting me in this moment to share what you're feeling. Let's go process this together. For me, that is expressed delight for the inner child. It is this complete and total thankfulness for everything he does, even when it appears to be antisocial at first. So say he wants to be violent. I mean, like, thank you for sharing that with me. I'm so glad that it, that's out of the, out of the shadows and into the light now. Like, that's awesome. Like, this is so fantastic that you're sharing. And imagine you got a five-year-old kid here. He's like, really? I did a good thing. Woo. We're, this is fun time. Right? So it's just like, thank you for sharing that with me. All oh, right. And it's like, I understand why you feel that way. And it's like, and it's so, oh, I putting, you're helping me put all the pieces together now. Why I've always acted like this around that kind of person and blah, blah, blah. But then you say, okay, I get it. I, I see that you want to be violent. You want to go blow up a car or something. And it's like, but we know that because I can predict the future, we know that that's going to really hurt in the future. So we're not going to do it that way. But help me understand why you want to go do that thing. And listen and listen. Oh, oh okay, okay. I, will f I promise you, because I'm going to make you the number one thing in my life, I promise you I will find a way to get that need met. We're just not going to do it that way. Right? Because you saw that in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, and that's not really real. And, you know, it's not going to work out the way you think. And whatever. Right, you know? So it's this playful interaction with this child that is expressing these emotions that kind of feel out of control. And when he does that, and I express delight at every stage of the game, it builds trust, and he starts to feel safe with me. So I have evoked a feeling of safety and trust with my inner child so that he begins to communicate with me more in bigger ways and in a broader scope about life. And guess what? When that happens, he starts trusting me 
to manage the situation and he doesn't hit the hijack button so much, which means I get triggered less. Less frequently and at less intensity. Oh yeah, shunning and shaming doesn't seem to ever work. Um, but that's a fantastic question. What do we do? So here's a child. I know what's right and wrong, or do I? But okay, let's <laughs> let's say I do, right? And then the child does this thing, and it's just like the child was pursuing something because they always are. Okay. So this would be because the their their emotional system is basically hijacked and taken over. We have to create a container for them where they're safe. So this is physical distance from the, the instigating. So you hit the brother. We need to separate the two. Now I need to sit down, create the container and be like, I'm here with you. I understand these are big emotions. Like, do you need anything right now? Help me understand why you hit your brother. Like, did it feel good? Did it feel bad? How does it feel now? Right? And it's this, it'd be this level, these exp explorative ways of curiosity. Because what you have to do is you have to convince them that there will be no shame. If shame comes online, they'll go into hiding. Would you do it in that moment or would you wait for the uh, brain chemicals to subside? Well, you have to create physical safety in the moment. And then it basically, I, I would think, I'm, I'm thinking about how I would do it. I would do, I would do, hopefully I've got assistance to take the other one. That's why we should ever only have one child. But anyway, <laughs> but okay, no, I'm kidding a little bit. But so it's like I would do physical safety initially for, for physical safety and separation for both. And then the one that's most dysregulated, I would sit with that one. God, this is so hard because if you're by yourself and you got two and they're both dysregulated, man. That's a, oh, this is why we grew up in communities. This is why we grew up in tribes. Like the, the singular living house thing is a big driver for all this, in my opinion. Anyway, okay, well, let's say I've got a, a companion or assistant or whatever that can take the other one. And we know the other one's going to be safe. Let's just do that. Okay, now I'm going to sit with this one and be like, I'm here with you. No, we're not going to go that way. No, we're not going to go this way. Like, we're going to be right here right now. And then the emotions will bubble up, especially if they're needing autonomy. And they're going to be like, I want to go and hit and do whatever I want. It's just like, so now it's physical re restraint of some capacity. Give them as much autonomy as you can without a risk of safety. And then witness the emotions with them. Because that's what the child is. The child does not have the wisdom or capacity of nervous system to process that level of emotional uprising. So they are leaning on your advanced emotional processing skills to assist. And in the assisting, you are also demonstrating what it looks like, what it feels like, how much time it takes, what kind of facial expressions happen when I am managing a processing an emotion. They're learning that as you're going through the process. So in that moment, you're also a mentor, right? You're a teacher, mentor, container holder, go through all that, let the process go through, and it will probably take 35 minutes because that's the amount of time it's going to take for that level of activation to subside. I mean, the next one is like, yeah. Exactly. Wait, say, say that again. They need to learn what? They need to learn, like, not to get their brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But, but it's not about them hitting the brother. The hitting the brother is the expression of the emotional uprising. So what we want to do is we want to teach them because, okay, they don't hit their brother. Instead, they go down and hit the mailman, right? Or they hit the dog, right? Or they hit themselves, right? It's like we can't go for the, the outward expression of the emotional upheaval. We, have, we want to dig it, and that feels attunement. You're just like, oh, She's help in the way that mom is sitting with me and processing through all these emotions. She's helping me see that I've got emotions under the surface that made me want to hit my brother. Right? And it's like, oh, right. And you're trying to help them expand the capacity of their nervous system little bit by little bit by little bit. That's why it takes 18 years. And then we do that. 
we help them process the initial driving emotion and whatever the, the stimulus was. And then it's, there's no shame for the hitting their brother. We'd say, yeah, we know that that's not okay because now your brother's hurt, right? And, or whatever, right? There's ways of doing that. But it's not this shame on you for doing a bad thing. It's like, help me understand what brought you to that place. And then I will help you process it together. Turns out that what I just described is exactly what we need to do in a romantic relationship. Because when my partner gets triggered, they basically turn into their five-year-old who just hit their brother. And so what I just talked about, that process, is if we can do that for our partner, assuming that I have capacity for it, I do that for my partner, create the space, and it's not like, I don't know, what's the thing? I think of something triggering. It's like, it's like, okay, she yelled at me and said that I was a stupid idiot, right? It's just like, you know, I, I made her some tea and I put in too much sugar. And she's like, oh, you stupid idiot, blah, 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 blah. Oh, now I feel attacked. I'm hurting, whatever. And it's like, okay, now my traumas all get activated and I lash out and then we're playing trauma ping pong. Ching, ching, ching. <laughs> and then, so instead of that, I say, okay, oh, that definitely struck something do i have capacity right now to like go through this process and it's like let's assume i do then i'm like okay hey partner what the words that just came out of your mouth came into my system and triggered things that were really painful i am interested in talking about that for a few minutes do you have capacity for that no okay Right? If it's no on Thursday and it's no on Friday and it's no on Saturday, maybe I need to ask my questions about do I really want to be here? But let's say it's no on Friday, but it's yes on Saturday. Okay, now it's yes on Saturday. And then I'm like, this is what I heard. This is how it, the, when I, this is nonviolent communication. When I heard these words come into my ears, these feelings arose inside me and they don't feel good. And they're probably because of, and then I list off my childhood wounds, because I know my childhood wounds. So this childhood wound I have was activated in this way, and it really doesn't feel good. So the question is along these lines that it's like, I've learned how to control my anger very well. And now if I'm in the context of a romantic relationship and my anger begins to arise, I'm so familiar with it. I know how to shut it down in the moment, not let them see it. And then I go off on my own and I do my own little thing. Sure, that's a strategy. That's one way of doing it. Eventually, though. Eventually. Like, so, what would you prefer? Would you prefer they find out now or they find out in two years? Yeah. If that's, if that's, if that level of anger or the way you think or the way you act or whatever is a total hard non-negotiable for them and they don't find out until 18 months, and then they're like, whoa, I didn't know this about you. I'm out. Yeah. Right? This is why I say that in the dating process, as early as possible, you want to see that person triggered as fuck. And you want them to see you triggered as fuck. Because if I see you at your worst, in your most out of control, and I'm like, yeah, I can deal with that. Like, that's within, okay, I understand. And how cool is it that you're sharing this with me in a vulnerable way? Like, wow. And then I do the same thing and you still accept me? It's like, whoa, we are on a totally different game at that point. We're not at this point where it's just like, oh, I got to make sure I do. It's like, no, you've seen me be an ass, right? And, and it's like, and you still accept me. I don't have to try so hard. I mean, I will still, hopefully. It's tricky, right? Like, how do you present it in an empty way that people understand you without judging you? So what if they judge you? Like, if they're going to judge you, like, if I come forward, yeah. so if I do my homework before I ever meet this person, I'm like, yeah, that's, okay, I'm really weak right here. Yeah. I'm kind of strong right there. I got some question marks about that one. Like, and I'm doing the work in my own personal time to get in touch and building this relationship so that this relationship is very solid. And I know who I am, and I know where my weaknesses are, and I go to a, the table and I say, 
yeah, that's really is a weakness of mine. And I'm not bragging about it. And I'm not throwing it out, you know, like, hey, look at how cool and enlightened I am. I'm just like, yeah, this is a truth about who I am on this earth. And they judge me for that. It's like, thank you very much. Goodbye. I, I don't need, I don't need another 10 seconds of that. This is why we're looking for the no instead of the yes. It's like, like I want to be in a situation where you show your worst feelings towards me. I would. Yeah. Why not? What are you doing? What? Okay. We'll back up from there. Why am I here? Why am I sitting at this table with that person? Answer that question first. Do I need to get their approval? Do I want to feel pretty today? Do I want to feel like I'm loved and attracted and desired and I swiped a couple of times till I found someone that like, yeah, like if they say I'm pretty, that's going to matter. But if that guy says I'm pretty, nah, I don't give a shit, right? If that's the dynamic, which I've said before, I'm starting the whole thing from a place that I need something from you. I'm here to get something. And if I'm here to get something, whew, it's like, that's just like weird. I'm not going to say it's poison, but it's definitely something kind of like poison. And it like sneaks into everything. So it's like, if I'm, so ans answer the question, why am I here at this table? And if my goal is to find someone that will be a suitable partner for the life that I want to build for the next three to 18 years, then why not? Then I'm doing a job interview and I need to make sure that they're qualified. <laughs> and you have to ask what's a childhood trauma. Yeah, boom. You can. You're, you can say anything you want. First thing I'd say is if I feel like I'm performing or I'm on tightrope, I'm already, I've already lost the game, right? It's like, I want to show up at the table with zero sense of performance. I want to show up at the table exactly who I am, where I stand, what I'm desiring, know all that and know what I'll put up with and what I won't. And I want to do that. I want to, I want to, I want to do the homework ahead of time so that when I get to the table, it is just me and my natural state with zero effort of performance and let them filter me. That's okay. Cause I'm going to filter you too. Because the reason why this is so important is because it's like, no, 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 maybe no, 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 no. Yes. And when you meet the yes, you're like, holy shit. I didn't even know. Like I've had so many no's in my life. When I finally meet a yes, you're just like, oh, and then it's just effortless. Well, not effortless, but I mean, it's like so many things click into place because you're not performing for their approval. You're not trying. You're not, you're not asking them to change who they are. They're just showing up naturally who they are. And you're like, oh, look, we've got compatibility and we've got similar goals. And it's like, and I'm, you're able to be vulnerable with me and I'm able to be vulnerable with you. And it's just like, so think of it this way. Is your truth about you someone that would want to sit at the table and try to make it work? Because if that's true for you, like, did that make sense? But like, I'm saying figure out what I'm looking for and figure out where my non-negotiables are and show up with no apologies about that. Well, who I am, my truth, I might be the kind of person that's like, yeah, I want a marriage like from the 50s. Where it's just like, we show up, we recognize we're not fully compatible, but I'm going to show up in a healthy way, as healthy as I'm possible, and I expect you to do the same. And we're going to sit here and we're going to partner up together and we're going to try to make it work. If that's who you are, then show up like that. Because I guarantee you will eventually find someone that feels the same way. How good are you? Question? I do. Okay. My answer is, how good are you at ending a relationship? If you are good at ending a relationship, you can be more relaxed. I mean, again, if you're following my advice here, if I'm good at recognizing, okay, this is not working for me, like not, not just like, oh, I've got some doubts, but like I am making a decision. This relationship does not work for me anymore. And I am going to bring it to a close in the most respectful and loving way possible. I personally, 
but this starts how you do development and yeah. development and yeah. relations like a pretty nice leap. Yeah. Right? So like for me I try to stay and see because I right. try to take ownership of what I'm looking outside. Right. You know, like so even if I no, I just try to the end. So that's telling me that your value, so we all have this thing I call value hierarchy, right? This is more valuable than that. Like getting a Frappuccino is less important than like saving a puppy, right? It's just like we have these different values. And so what you're showing me is that your value on self-development and challenging yourself to raise to the next level is more important to you than like the discomfort you're going to feel in a relationship that's maybe not aligned so well, right? That like... You're prioritizing this personal growth. Yeah. 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 Which is fine. That's who you are. And that's the way you, okay, that's okay. kind of, that's kind of the way that I am too. Right. To find my body. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm actually very much on the same page. Like I come into a relationship and I will stay longer than is appropriate. Sometimes well, it would be appropriate for most people because I'm in the same way. I'm just like, Ooh, this is challenging. I have dealt with so many things. But this one sneaking in between the cracks and getting me <laughs> in a place that I haven't been gotten in quite a while. So I'm going to stick around for a while and kind of see how this plays out. And then the guys in my men's group are just like, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, no, 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 I got this. Yeah. I, yes, it's very true. Yeah. Right. Well, so, but some people are ready for that and others are not. Some people are like, yes, I'm, I'm ready to face this challenge now. And I will say that to many people that they're in a relationship that's challenging where it seems to be a repeating pattern. It's like, do you want to resolve it now or do you want to resolve it in six months, right? Or six years, right? You get to choose at what point that you face that demon, but he's going to be sitting there waiting for you every relationship you get in, right? And those demons are usually something over here in the attachment system, right? I didn't quite finish that, but um, the last one just for the sake is support for autonomy. And the support for autonomy is like, I've got the toddler in my lap and he's like, I want to get down. So you're like, okay, you get down. He's like, I want to go explore. And so he goes exploring and then something happens. Like he falls and trips and he hits his knee or something. And now suddenly he's has this flood of difficult emotions that arise in him. He turns and he looks back to the, what we call the stable base. And he says, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. And I will not shame you and I will not blame you for pursuing your autonomous exploration of the world. And so the, the next step, why, how this goes, how this works, is that these are the five experiences that we want, that we need to feel viscerally, to feel wanted, chosen, and prioritized. If any one of them, so this one's really low, those are full, but this one's low and that one's half. If any one of these is less than our need, we end up with a broken attachment system. You can't build an attachment system on just attunement. You can't build an attachment system just on autonomy. It is literally, it's a marriage of all five pillars holding up the roof. And if any one of them is insufficient, your attachment system ends up with a void right there, which will then create the hunger which I hunger, craving, or longing. This, think of it this way. This is like a ma this is like almost like a mathematical description of the attachment system that lives inside our body. It is formed in the first 18 months. If it, you do not get an adequate amount by the end, you end up with a craving or longing in the first 18 months. So now that means you've got a broken or dysfunctional attachment system. And then you walk forward in life with a craving for support when I'm dysregulated. I'm hungry for it. I want to be in a place where I feel comfortable and safe enough that I can just lose my shit and not be blamed, not be shamed, not be told I'm un unsafe or toxic male or whatever. Right? I just want to feel, I want to be in a place that I can feel safe to just be like a messed up human sometimes. And that hunger will live in me forever until I get it addressed. So most of us walk into relationships 
with a dysfunctional or broken attachment system because we have a hunger for one of those five things or all of them. One to well, it's it's awareness a that it, that that's what's the the driving force, and the next part is then then what do we do about it, right? And so the first part I want to teach is like that's the awareness, and it maps in with this, um, and then it's like okay. Once I'm aware, I can understand that like I'm feeling super triggered right now with my partner or my mom or my boss because I have this hunger for support for, for the freedom and ability to be dysregulated when my emotions go crazy instead of trying to compress myself into a little box all the time, right? That's my hunger and that's my craving and it's going to manifest in every relationship I have with another human. Okay, now I'm aware of that. And just that is amazing because then you start seeing it and you start seeing the evidence that supports it and you start seeing the dynamic of how it works. And then when that happens, the triggering process kind of begins to slow down because what happened is your inner child is sitting there being like, yeah, duh, I've been trying to tell you this your whole life. Now you're finally listening to me. Okay, and he begins to trust us a little bit more, and then the process begins to slow down. Um, you know what dissociation is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So dissociation is this idea that um, you can actually watch it on certain types of brain scans. I've heard that dissociation is this idea that like emotions are going hot, 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 hot. The stress hormones go up, 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 and then there's this like this point of overwhelm that's reached, and you're basically cut off from the actual sensing of the emotions. They're still alive neurochemically. They're still alive inside your system very much. Yes? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the, it, that's one of the stress hormones. It's like adrenaline, which is also called norepinephrine. Cortisol, those are the two big ones. There's a few others, uh, but those are the two big ones. Um, but yeah, and there's this also thing with vagal nerve theory that about the stage that you get to where you get cut off from your emotions because things are too overwhelming. This person that I was talking about earlier, as we began to, as we create successfully created a safe space and we began to process triggers as they happened, something very fascinating happened. This is someone who is extremely skilled at dissociation. Like any situation that was even mildly uncomfortable could just be like, boop, click, and it's just like zombie mode. You know, huge emotions, nothing. And we, and it was like, you could watch it happen. You're just like, like, ooh, hot, 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 hot. And then it's just like, oh, I feel nothing now. I'm like, oh shit, now we're dissociated. Okay. As we created a safe space, and as we held, provided the five pillars of attachment in moments of dysregulation, what happened was the dissociation stopped firing. And she had moments where she's like, this sucks. This is super uncomfortable. Where's my dissociation? I'm counting on it showing up and saving my ass right now so that I can be in this social situation. It was actually in this room with all these people. And I don't have to feel like I'm crazy because my emotions are out of control. Where is it? Hey, dissociation, come save me. And the kid's like, no, 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 no. You have advanced. I trust you now to actually feel these emotions. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to protect you from them. And that became a regular thing. That was just like, it, it totally lines up with the theories. And we were like literally watched it happen in real time. That it's like dissociation, dissociation, dissociation. And as you get better and better and better at building this trust between the adult and the inner child, the dissociation will eventually go away. And it's like, now you're ready for, now you're ready to be a big boy, right? And actually have emotions and I'm going to let you have them and I'm going to throw them over the curtain into your lap so that you can actually process them and understand what it is I'm going through back here. Oh, how? Yeah. Yeah. This, that's the, build, the building of the trust between adult and inner child that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. It's like the, one of the ways you do that is to tune out the rest of the world, which is prioritizing the inner child and saying, 
I'm going to, this next 10 to 30 minutes, I'm going to be with you right now, and I'm going to invite you. You don't have to. I'm not going to pressure you. But I'm going to create this space so that you can share whatever in the world you're feeling. It can be angry. It can be hateful. It can be destructive. You can feel whatever you want, and I will hold this space and be with you through it, and I will not blame, I will not shame. You'll get nothing but support and love from me. And like I said, the first couple of times you do that, he's, she's going to be like, I don't believe this. You're full of crap. But eventually you do it enough times and she'll be like, oh, you're real. You're, you have earned my trust. And as, she, as you earn her trust, she'll begin to give you more. Just like a child that's testing you to say, are you really here for me? It's like, I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm going to give you, I'm going to make it a little bit more challenging. I've got this whole ocean of grief and pain back here that I'm hiding from you. Are you ready for it? And it's like a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. I've actually seen this happen several times just in the past year. And it's like a little bit more, a little bit more. A little, oh, okay. I trust you now. And it's just like, Burr! open up the door and the whole ocean of grief comes through. Because at that point in time, it's not, it's not they're doing a bad thing. That's never helpful. Pointing the finger never works, right? It's not they're doing a bad thing. It's like I'm with someone that will deflect and avoid accountability every time big emotions come up. Well, uh, maybe not every time, but in, in this point. And it's like, why am I choosing to be with someone that is deflecting like that? All right. It looks like our time is up. So Thank you. you're very welcome. You're very welcome.